there's not a lot of guys that could do that. I mean, we'd be hoisting the winch over the edge, pulling guys up. Well, I was feeling like a sissy this morning. I'm like, why am I so <laughs> sore? <laughs> We've got a house on our show. <laughs> <laughs> This isn't your grandpa's willy bugger. I happen to know somebody uh, at Drop Jaw Flies that got one of these stuck in their finger and they work really well. <laughs> They're hard to get out. <laughs> hey guys, welcome to the Drop Jaw Flies podcast. On this episode, we talk about cold weather fishing. We'll cover tips and tactics the effect that cold weather has on the line, reel, and rod. We'll also talk about our packs and gear and essential items that are always in our pack. If you like the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review on our YouTube channel. I am Chad Nelson, along with Jason Arvey, my co-host. So, without further ado, here is today's podcast. Well, I can, I can tell you, brother, from my experience fishing with a lot of people that after hiking down that hill and then basically on the move all day and casting all day that coming up that hill at, at the very end um there's not a lot of guys that could do that i mean we'd be hoisting the winch over the edge pulling guys up over that rim well i was feeling like a sissy this morning i'm like why am i so <laughs> sore why am i tired but you're right uh i mean i think we only hiked three miles yesterday maybe but it was vertical and then but we did bouldering all day long yeah and, and climbing over rocks constantly constantly you know and casting those heavy flies and the eight weight rod oh uh, i mean how many casts do you think we we got in yesterday i'd like to know that myself i i really would i i try to estimate that one time and it's it's a lot. It, it really is, and to heft that weight, it, the, these big flies don't feel like much when you hold them, but when they're under speed and under like a dynamic force, they turn into a lot heavier weight than just if you're just holding them in your hand and do that all day long. And all of a sudden, my shoulders and everything are good, but I'm having trouble with my elbow. Your, your elbow right there lately. And I think it's because of the gloves that we've been using. I just can't grip it. So this has to take up yeah. something, make up for what I can't grip. Yeah, when the weather turned cold and I started casting with gloves on, I noticed it too. Um, my hands and my forearm a little bit were getting a little tired. It's for the same reasons you said. You can't get as good a grip on the rod with bulky gloves on. So I feel it a little bit too, but... For me, it's my back, and I need to start taking my pack off more because we have so much crap in our packs. <laughs> yeah. When you cast with your pack, it just limits you so much, uh, your range of motion. And our packs are big. What, Chad? They're 3,000 cubic feet or cubic feet. <laughs> We've got a house on our show. <laughs> That's what it feels like, though. They're 3,000 cubic inches. Um, yeah. Man, when I started fishing with you years ago, I thought you were nuts because your bag was always busting at the seams. <laughs> you always had so much stuff on, and now I get it. Oh, uh, well. So when you start off in the morning, right? We we have we're totally bundled up right out of the truck because it's so cold. But then as the day progresses in late fall, it kind of warms up, and you have to shed those layers, especially when you're hiking. And if you don't have the room to put that your layers in, then, you know, you're ditching your clothes here and there. Oh. And that's no good. Well, when we, we got up there yesterday, um, and it wasn't uh, real early. It was, we met at 8 o'clock. It was 24 degrees. But fortunately, yeah, that's cold. But we had no wind, um, and we had sun yesterday, so it, it was good. A okay. The week before, well, just five days earlier, it was twenty-two degrees when we got up there, but it was gale force winds, uh, no sun, and the wind chill. I actually I pulled up a wind chill factor table online. Uh -huh. I, I was just curious to see 
how cold it really was for us that we were fishing in. When we got up there, and we met earlier that morning, um, so with the wind chill, it was like 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and it, it warmed up to a balmy 15 degrees for us Ooh. later in the day. Yeah. Get the lawn chairs out. <laughs> Sunscreen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was cold. It was cold fishing. But we had more success in the cold conditions than we did yesterday with the sun shining, calm water, and a full moon. We we really did. That week before, all that wind, I think, was churning up the sediment in the water. So the fish's vision or their ability to see just wasn't as good, right? And then the chop on the water hides our silhouette, hides the line splash. You can you can splash a huge fly down right next to a fish when there's waves and they don't know. So you have all these factors that are on your side when there's a storm or a pre-storm or whatever. And we're wishing for calm weather during that time, but we're catching fish. And then we got our wish yesterday, just like you said, no wind, total calm, nice bright sun, you know, to keep us warm. But those are just totally the wrong conditions for the fishing that we were doing yesterday. So, yeah, we were able to take the gloves off a little bit yesterday, uh, literally, you know, took the jackets off. It was nice, but the fishing wasn't as good. (laughs) <laughs> totally clear water bright sun uh what a what the moon was huge the night before that's always a bad factor because yeah. the fish eat a ton they're able to see um in the in the nighttime so they can chow down and when morning comes they're just not as hungry so we yeah it was bad conditions for catching fish but for actually being out there in late fall was was awesome oh man perfect couldn't have asked for better conditions so um jason cold conditions like this um when are fish active and let's talk about lakes first because we we've primarily been fishing in the lakes yeah well activity with the fish is generally going to be a you know how hungry they are really um because the water temperature means so much this time of year it's finally cooled off and the fish are able to move about wherever they want to because the temperature is not inhibiting them uh this time late late november um it's not hot in the shallows so they don't have to spend their time in the deep water um they can go wherever they want to basically but um it's it's to the point now maybe high 40s uh, low 50s, and the Bear Lake cutthroat evolved in those temperatures. They they just love that temperature, and so they can be very active in that. At one foot depth, all the way up to, uh, and, and this is weird, Chad, a lot of people don't understand this, but the water temperature down lower is actually maybe a little warmer than it is up top now. And so they have this mobility to go deep, to go shallow. And if there's fish around, little bait fish around, what, what, at whatever depth, this because the bait fish need to be comfortable too. They, they won't spend their time where it's too cold or too hot. They're going to go where it's comfortable. So wherever you find those bait fish now, that's where the cutthroat are going to be. And uh, we didn't really see the cutties up showing themselves up on the surface until late in the afternoon, which tells me that that's when the bait fish kind of came up out of the deep water and and went to go look for some food themselves. And when they're available, the cutties are right there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you and I are fishing with streamers. And uh, yesterday, both of us, we were kind of experimenting. You know, we'd, we'd cast out our streamers. Sometimes we'd start bringing them right away. Uh, Sometimes we'd let them sink for 10 to 20 seconds and then start stripping. Um, Talk about that and what you noticed letting it sink versus bringing it in right away when the streamer's more on the surface. Yeah, um, as far as the fishing went, I mean, and I'll just pull this up, Chad, so people can see these. This isn't your grandpa's willy bugger. Um, whoops, I don't know if, <laughs> there it is. Um, this is a seven inch fly and it, it is bulky. Um, this hook right here might look small, 
but it's a 5 aught uh, owner hook, something that you'd use for a really big bass lure. And then we've got this is a very large secondary hook, a Gamakatsu 2 aught B10S stinger. And then this guy, on the very back, this trailing hook would be what you'd put a gigantic egg, glow bug, on. So you got seven inches of gigantic fly. And what that it does, it helps us, it sinks pretty quick, so maybe it goes down a foot a second. So if you count that down, like you said, 20 seconds, you should be about 28, uh, depending on the line that you use. And I found that at 20 feet where we were fishing, I just didn't... We didn't get that many follows or chases, and so either where we were, there was no fish, or they just weren't active at that depth. You know, they'd see it possibly, but they weren't very interested in it. So fast stripping, slow stripping, all depths, it, I think it was just the location that we were at, that we were having trouble until we found the sweet spot, <laughs> which, yeah. We we probably needed a boat yesterday, <laughs> it, which was a weed bed. It was over a ten foot weed bed. Yeah. Well, we had we had a lot of conditions not conducive to good fishing, but yeah, we gave it a go. We 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 did land a few. Um, we both had some hits that we didn't land, but still a great day to be out. It was. I mean, what would we be doing other than that? Uh, <laughs> I can think of a lot of things that are uh, not fun to do. Dishes, dishes, vacuuming, <laughs> laundry. But, yeah, all that, all that good stuff. But no, um, your question just is there's so many answers to it, and that's the variables of this time of year that you've got to figure out is – where you're at if you don't find them on the surface you count down five seconds go five feet deeper give that a strip maybe do it quick the first time if you don't get a quick or if you don't get a hit cast out again go to five feet and do a slower strip and if that doesn't work repeat that to 10 feet and if i don't get anything or see a fish within you know three or four casts then it's our mod or method of operation to go down 30 feet or even 50 feet and repeat and so there's a lot of walking a lot of casting a lot of setting up that first cast is so important but what we found out the first three or four hours of our trip that we were in a deeper section of the lake uh, and there just wasn't a lot of activity there so yeah what Chad had mentioned before, if you fish the day after a bright moon, just be happy to be on the water, <laughs> right? Right. Because the fish are already full from the night before. Yes, and, and the ones we landed, they had a full belly, definitely. They did. So the other thing you can do if you're having trouble finding the fish, uh, just locate an eagle in the sky watch it dive bomb the lake and you'll know where the fish are man we had that happen right in front of us that was pretty cool to see gosh those are big birds um what i think what i saw and i don't know if you saw the same thing but we were back in a cove uh right off the main channel and there was a school of cutthroat and it looks like they they were trying to swallow a chub that was a little big for them and it looked like a bunch of them were trying to have a go at it <laughs> and so while they were up on the surface this eagle comes down and he hit he hit the water with his talons but he just he couldn't bring up the fish and the fish that are after those huge chubs are not small <laughs> they're really big and so i thought you know, that eagle was pretty ambitious trying to pick up one of those <laughs> giant cutties it was pretty cool to see though it was. I, I got out the camera in hopes that he would g give it a second go, but he didn't. Yeah, I think he was like, oh, those are a little too big. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Jason, uh, in, in regards to this topic, cold weather fishing, what effect does cold weather have on your line, your reel, and your rod? Wow. You know, the cold uh, can really mess things up for your equipment um your rod for one is is constantly having water splashed on it from the line pulling up the water and it's freezing on your rod 
So that can that can cause problems. Your the graphite and the fibers would ever get so brittle because they're so cold that it, they're easier to break. That's for sure. And then the water can get into your reel and freeze up in the gears and expand and screw everything up. <laughs> that's no fun. But when it gets that cold, you know your guides totally freeze up and eventually uh, your line just freezes solid. And so you've got to put your rod into the water because that's the warmest place, meld everything, and then you'll get a few casts after that. And, and if you can do that all day, you're a tough man or, or a woman yes. to be able to, to fish in those conditions. So your, your line, though, if it's freezing but not quite that cold, like the wind isn't blowing, your, what happens is your line, the coating on it gets so stiff that, that that can be kind of a chore too. It, your you know your line's not supple anymore, and it's it's pretty stiff and it can kink and yeah. Yeah, your neighbor broke his rod just a few days ago. You know, just bent it a little too far. It was stiff and snapped. Yeah. <clears throat> what what happened is the guys were freezing up up the top and the the backing knot can sometimes go into the the tip top, that very first guide. Yep. And if you go to break the, try and break that out and you pull down on your line to get the tip closer to you so that you can bust the ice out, that's what happened. And it just snapped. It just, so <clears throat> rod's out of commission for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you just got to take that into account. Your rod doesn't have as much flexibility in the cold as it does in the warmer southern, summer months. So Chad, to combat that, the thing to do is to never break your the ice out with your fingers. So you put it in the water and and wiggle it, and it, that movement or whatever will melt the ice, and your, and your rod will be perfectly straight, and there won't be any strain on it while it's cold. So instead of breaking the guides out or out of the very that those top sections of your rod because they're so small and delicate that the bottom guides you can pop those out with your fingers you probably not have a problem you usually don't break that part of your rod but it's those top two sections never break those out with your hands stick it in the water wiggle it around and let it melt off that's a great tip okay let's uh <clears throat> let's go to a mailbox question let's uh, do it a <clears throat> uh, question that's come in they ask, what pack and what pack size do we use for our backcountry adventures? <clears throat> well, Chad, you, you have so much experience backpacking back in the backwoods, Alaska, Canada, whatever. So I, I know what I use, but tell people the reasons why you use what you do. I think that'd be good. <laughs> why I own six packs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you, um, there isn't, for what we do, I haven't found the f perfect fishing pack yet, meaning Fish Pond, Patagonia, uh, Umpqua. They don't make one as big as, as what you and I would like. So uh, for what you and I do, we've gone to a Kelty. It's a 3,000 cubic inch pack, and uh, it's perfect, well, almost perfect for what we do, meaning all the gear that we carry, the base layers, coats, and, and in a little bit, I'm going to go through a gear list, um, items that I don't leave home without, items okay. that I have in my pack right now for these colder weather months. But for right now, 3,000 cubic inches seems to be pretty decent for what you and I do. The drawback to going with the Kelty or another pack that, that isn't a fishing line is the number of pockets. What I love about Fish Pond, Umpqua, some of these other companies, Patagonia, you know, these are fishing specific packs and they have pockets and compartments for flies and everything that you might need. Those typically have, you know, five to seven, five to eight outer pockets, which is perfect. Right. Now our Kelty only has five, but we're making do with it. Yeah, I, and, and really, what, what and probably what you carry is we don't have all the teeny boxes for flies, um, all the, the, the things that you need, all the gadgets or whatever. We just need a box, and we have a spool of tippet, and then we have some clippers. 
<laughs> that's all we have. And so that's why some of the bigger packs work so well for what we do is we just don't carry all that, that stuff when we're, we're doing this kind of streamer, streamer fishing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I would tell guys, um, you know, go with size, maybe more over number of pockets because there are you can find little compartment storage and in fact you and i are going to do a future podcast here shortly on on boxes and packs and storage and getting organized but for me having enough room to to accommodate everything that we carry is more important than the perfect pockets and and compartments you bet jerky snickers (laughs) some water (laughs) (laughs) definitely uh, and and just a ton of clothes because shedding the layers and putting them on is just that's the most important thing when when, when you're back country if you get stranded back there for some reason you have got to have the clothes that will help you survive that overnight experience that you might have and so you're just put on that our fishing companies just don't make the packs big enough for for what we're doing with them more they're more i think summer oriented or you know you you park somewhere in the winter walk 50 yards to the river and you're back not not doing backcountry stuff in the winter like what we, we've been doing yeah hiking three miles in your waders <laughs> three miles in your muck boots <laughs> <laughs> who does that <laughs> <laughs> crazy guys <laughs> yeah yeah <clears throat> all right guys we're back so apologize for the technical difficulties so let's jump right into it jason the the essential items that we take with us on our cold weather fishing trips and some items that we just always have in our pack so number one is a base layer um this time of year You've got to wear a base layer, something like merino wool, uh, polyester, something that wecks the sweat away. away. So, you know, when you're out hiking, um, burning a lot of calories, you you work up a sweat, but you want something that's sweat wicking. Right. Uh, You know, last time, last week, we showed up on the the water, and uh, it was 20 degrees, I think, or or something like that, but the sun was out, and it was really bright. And I noticed right off the bat, just with our base layer being black, uh, I think you should have a lot of black clothes in the winter. You know, obviously, it absorbs the, the sun and the heat. And one thing I know we mentioned earlier is our backpack, because I had to take a lot of layers off. It was so warm shove those down in the backpack and uh i I think i only had two layers on to start it was 20 degrees but we had the sun beating down and coming off the snow too and so um it was cold but it was warm kind of a weird deal so uh and i think maybe we mentioned this earlier but our backpacks gotta be big enough to fit all the layers uh if we take them off they've got to go back into the pack yeah yeah definitely uh number two then is a mid layer and this is your insulation layer down works great as does fleece but something in between your base layer and then your number three item which is your outer layer uh this is typically some type of shell that's a wind stopper and it can also maybe double as a light type of rain jacket um, so, you know, when we were fishing, uh, last week in that biting wind, gale force winds, that, that third layer, well, all three layers were critical, but, you know, keeping the wind off was critical. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> okay. Number four is socks. And, uh, I typically pack at least one, sometimes two extra pair of socks, <laughs> Um, and, and for, for different reasons, you know, warmth, insulation, comfort. Um, I have gotten wet feet before, you know, taking a, a dump in the river or the lake. And so being able to change out into another pair of socks, especially in the cold weather, this is critical. Definitely. Um, I take a couple pairs just like you do because in the event, and you always have to prepare, you know, in the event you have to do an overnight trip, an extra pair of socks you can put on your hands, uh, even if you don't need them for your feet, just to keep them warm in case your gloves were 
uh, were wet or you can wrap them around your neck. You know, there's a bunch of different uses for them. Yeah, absolutely. Your extremities, that's critical. And, and that takes us to number five, which is gloves. Um, I have been on a mission the last four months, Jason, trying to find the perfect pair of fishing gloves. And <laughs> <laughs> to this point, I don't know that they exist. Um, yeah. I have lately I've been taking three different pair of gloves and you know I end up changing out one sometimes two pair because either my hands get cold or they get wet and uh, you just got to have extra gloves to keep your hands warm. Yeah definitely I, I'm, I'm with you I take a heavy pair of gloves uh, for our trip in and out uh, and in case of the eventual well overnight trip I would take the big it's like you would ski gloves yeah what you would take and then a pair of work gloves and then of course the fishing gloves and i may have two pairs of those because you're taking your gloves on and off a lot yeah your hands get wet you put them back in the glove they get wet <laughs> uh and so I, you know four pairs of gloves is usually what i've been taking yeah you know, what I have used the last few times, and it's worked well, is the layering system for gloves. Uh, I have a couple pair of merino wool, one pair of uh, a polyester, <clears throat> excuse me, type uh, glove. Now, these are tight fitting to my hand, and these act as the base layer. And then I use, I put a, another pair of gloves on that's a shell, some type of wind stopper on. Uh, they do, it, and they do have a little bit of micro fleece lining in them. Oh yeah. Um, they these are the Cabela Guidewear gloves, and that's worked well. Now, after a while, my hands still get wet. The gloves get wet, but my hands don't get cold uh, because of that layering system. The merino wool insulates them, um, and the gloves fit tight enough that I can still get a good grip on my rod, and that's worked well. That is good. I think what we're looking for is a glove that fits well, keeps you warm, and is not huge because what you just mentioned, if you can't grip your rod well, and in my big ski gloves that aren't made for fishing, but they keep my hands warm, if there's a bad storm and a wind, and I'm, I've got, I'm using that glove to cast, my hand gets so tired and my whole casting system is affected because I can't grip the rod well enough. So <laughs> ideally, maybe in the future, we could get the glove that fits perfect, keeps us warm, and isn't so huge that we can still grip the, the rod. And that I think that's what we're looking for. Yeah, we, we better just design it because <laughs> we <be> <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found it yet. But, you know, if your toes get cold, if your hands are cold, um, it takes the focus off. It takes your mind off fishing, and you're, it just kind of ruins the outing. It does. Once once that focus is gone on what you're doing, it's just, it's all over with. And if we find those gloves, let's take four pairs of them each. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so next, Jason, is boots. Um, now, you and I tend to keep one to two extra pair of boots in our truck because sometimes you get to the fishing destination and it might be a ways from your home and you don't always know what the conditions are going to be like. You can check the weather reports, but... Sometimes you just don't know. There might be a foot of snow. There might be no snow. So being able to put on the right type of footwear when you get there is critical. It and, is. And for you, actually having boots on your feet <laughs> might help. <laughs> There's, there was an occasion where my boots didn't <laughs> make it into the truck or make it on my feet. <laughs> yes. That was just a month ago. Jason showed up in house slippers. <laughs> and not to be deterred, he fished all day in his house slippers. And uh, <laughs> rocky terrain, it wasn't a good place to be in your house slippers. Uh, th those were pretty tough. <laughs> they, they were, they were uh, Crocs, right? They had the lining inside and they were black. Um, the sole isn't quite there like it used to be after we walked down those really uh, sharp 45 degree angle uh slope or whatever uh, but wow make sure you have your all your gear in the vehicle before you take off <laughs> well in that case you jumped into my truck with me and forgot to put your boots in my truck so you had them in your vehicle you just didn't transfer them into my truck <laughs> <laughs> that was funny <clears throat> 
Yeah. Uh, next, Jason, is a beanie and face mask. And this is, you know, along the same theme as keeping extremities warm. But uh, you and I carry two to three beanies. Um, one is a thinner, tight-fitting beanie. Another one is thicker uh, for real cold conditions. And then a face mask, too. You bet. <clears throat> In the wind, don't you think that the face mask is just... Oh, it's so important to keep that cold, sometimes wet air from freezing on your face, and uh, love that. Love that when I need it. Um, the beanies are just a given. Um, Got to keep that heat on your head. And uh, I would, you know, one thing about the beanie. Sometimes you, it's hard to put a hat to get the bill over your eyes uh, to keep some of that sun. That's yeah. coming straight down uh, off so you can see clear. But I would take the beanie over a ball cap or any type of hat any day definitely. for the warmth. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's no comparison with warmth, you know, with a ball cap or other types of hats. Right. <clears throat> you know, and we'll get into this in a little bit. But, you know, in the case that there's an emergency situation and you gotta, you're going to be out longer than you planned, you know, you've got to have those extra layers, the insulation, the warmth. Uh, it, it could be a life-threatening situation. You never know. And and um, it's a good point that you bring up is that we're packing not just for that fishing day. We're packing in case you break your leg, I roll my ankle, or something like that where we can't get back. And our families don't have to worry about us. They know all oh, those guys are crazy. They take two days worth of stuff. They'll be fine. And so... Uh, yeah, most of the stuff we carry, I, I don't use, but it's good to know it's it's in the pack. Yeah, for sure. Well, you and I tend to go, uh, we, we tend to end up going further than we plan. I mean, <laughs> we're always like, all right, what, what's around the next bend? What's over the next hill? We just, we just keep going and going. And so we end up sometimes two, three miles from the truck. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. What is around the next quarter? Well, you don't know unless you walk over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, Jason, is eyewear. Um, now, we, t- we typically, we tend to fish in sunglasses, but in these cold conditions, uh, the first time I fished with you in cold weather, you showed up in ski goggles, mm. and I thought you were nuts. But uh, <laughs> I ended up trying it out a few weeks ago, and it was a big difference. Um, you know, keeping keeping the wind off your eyes, keeping your face warmer. If you get polarized ski goggles, man, it made a huge difference. Yeah, and it's something I learned back in the '90s um, by accident on the Green River. Um, I I just forgot my glasses, but I used to keep all my stuff in my car <laughs> for skiing and everything. And so I'm on the river. It's a bad day. I put the goggles on. You know, I'm like, this is looks weird, but. It was awesome. And so in a storm, uh, fishing, I'm always going to have those on. Because, you know, in a lake situation, Chad, you don't, you don't really need to see the fish. Uh, you're just casting to different places. And so the glass, the polarized glasses aren't really necessity on a lake, uh, especially in a storm. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Well, I, I learned years ago growing up in Canada that in the winter months, uh, you don't care what you look like. You just got to be warm. There is no fashion statements up there in the winter. And yeah. the conditions we were fishing in a few weeks ago, those ski goggles, man, I was glad I had them. Yeah, I definitely agree. Okay, let's get into a few items um, that are in our packs all the time. Um, and again, I kind of alluded to this a second ago, but in emergency type situations, uh, one is a first aid kit. <clears throat> now I have I carry in my pack it's about a 7 inch by 10 inch zippered pouch and this is kind of my emergency pack and in it I have a little first aid kit you know everything that should be in a first aid kit I keep a lighter in there I keep a little headlamp in there <clears throat> and a little water filter so kind of my emergency little bug out bag if you will but that always stays in my pack whether I'm hunting, fishing, anything outdoors. And I think that is a must-have. Mm, definitely. <clears throat> yeah. Next, yeah. Yeah. Next on the list is, is rain gear. Um, now, your shell can act as a double as a light rain jacket, but 
if you're fishing places like the Pacific Northwest, maybe Alaska, those guys know you need more than just a light rain jacket. You need full-on rain gear because it can rain cats and dogs nonstop all day long. And in fact, uh, you grew up there, Jason, didn't you? I did, and uh, my family being in construction, and uh, I remember working one year out we were out on a project a lot uh not it's always nice when you can get the outside of the house done and then work on the inside uh in the northwest because of the rain but when you have to frame a house or something and you're out there i was like uh grandpa we're not working today right because the rain he'd go well put your rain jacket on because we're working all day in it (laughs) and uh the, the heavy rain gear it's good to have it doesn't take a whole lot of space but um, if when you need it, yeah, you can slip it on and yeah. stay dry. Yeah, I mean, we're fortunate here in Utah. Uh, there's certain types of times of the year we don't need it. I just throw a light shell in my, in my bag and go, but I do have good rain gear for the times I need it. And when we're going to different parts of the country, Alaska, Canada, you, it's good to have. You bet. <clears throat> so uh, some type of source of ignition for a fire got to have water we carry the different clothes that can be used as bandages Mm -hmm. extra socks that kind of thing got to pack some food right um we both usually carry water filters yep the other thing um that i usually always have with me uh is a gun uh uh, a lot of guys don't you carry those whatever but i like to have one uh, out in the back country and i know you do too definitely always carry that Light is really important. Yes. Um, light source. Um, but yeah, all those kind of things just make it into our packs are just essential. Well, yeah, and again, the last five or six are in in the event that we need to spend a night out. I mean, we're a ways from the truck. Uh, somebody gets hurt. We get lost. You just can't make it back to the truck for whatever. And that's happened to me a couple times and I was glad that I had the gear that I had because uh, you know one of the scenarios was almost life life or death type situation what uh, maybe we should hear that story Chad that sounds good (laughs) (laughs) well we can laugh about it now but uh, so I was at Rick's College going to school up there and uh, my roommate was my good friend Brian Call uh, in fact, he's the host of the Gritty Bowman podcast. So if you like anything outdoor, adventure, survival tips, techniques, you should tune into his podcast too. Um, so one day after school, we just jumped in the truck or the car. Uh, we decided to hit the Snake River. We both liked fishing. Man, the Snake River is awesome fishing. We found a secret fishing hole that that we liked, and we liked it for a few reasons. It produced good fish, but mm. it was remote. Um, nobody knew about it, but you had to hike in a ways to get to it. <clears throat> so we were kind of prepared, but kind of not prepared. I showed up in uh, blue jeans. That's what I was wearing to school that day. <clears throat> that was not a good scenario, and we can <laughs> talk about that on a future podcast. But So I had actually fallen in the river. Now, this is the middle of January, Jason, so it was very cold. Ooh. Now, the day, you know, right after school when we got there, it was probably the warmest part of the day, so it wasn't too bad. We fished all the way until dark, and then we hiked back up to Brian's car to find out that he'd left the lights on and the car was dead. You were excited to get down to the water. (laughs) He was. Man, we were absent-minded college kids, and uh, yeah, we didn't check the lights. We just drove up, grabbed our fishing poles, and ran down to the river. (laughs) So we get back up there, and it's dark, and it's very, very cold. My pants, my blue jeans are as stiff as cardboard, frozen solid. So not a good situation. So we were lucky that we had fire starter. And, Jason, we built the biggest fire, (laughs) not as a signal, but to keep warm. We, we tried sitting in the car for a while to see if we could tough out the night in the car, but, but you know, anybody that's been in that situation knows the car doesn't insulate. No. I mean, it's just as cold in the car as it is out. So 
We built a massive fire, and we flipped every two minutes, front, back, front, back, all night long, just to stay warm. Um, our wives, we did, Brian and I were married at the time, and then we had a third guy with us who was single. But So between the, the three of us, we had about seven or eight fish. We'd caught close to our limit. Being college poor students, uh, we would keep all the fish that we could and take them home and eat them. Oh, you bet. So we ate all eight fish that night, uh, just <laughs> trying to pass the time, keep warm. Um, our wives had called the police and reported us missing sometime in the middle of the night. And about 4.30, we see headlights rolling up, and it was the sheriff, and he found us. He wasn't too happy, <laughs> I could tell, <laughs> being woken up at 4 in the morning to come find some stupid college kids. <laughs> but Jason, he wouldn't jumpstart our car. He wouldn't jump us. He said he'd give us a ride back into town, but he had all this uh, radio electrical equipment that he didn't want to risk frying up. So Nice guy. Yeah. Well, he got us home. We got back to town about 5.30 in the morning, and uh, <laughs> we survived. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, was your wife happy to see you? Just... <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife at the time, uh, not my current wife, no. I mean, she. I guess she was happy to see me, but Brian went home to hugs and kisses, got a little loving, and I, I got a tongue lashing. <laughs> Oh man! Our, the other buddy, Mark, he was single guy. He was he was kind of enjoying it. I think he wanted to spend the whole night out there. <laughs> he probably did. <laughs> uh, That's anyhow. a good story, though. Well, you know, in all seriousness, no, though, Jason, if we were not able to start a fire, uh, that could have been a really, really bad situation. Um, I don't think we had. <laughs> We we just had ball caps. Um, we didn't have beanies. Um, I don't even remember if we had gloves. But I think um, if we weren't able to start a fire, we would have started hiking out to the road. It was about three miles. <clears throat> and then started, once we hit the main road, back into Rexburg. But we probably would have had frostbite. Um, I think if we'd kept moving... Um, generating body heat all night long, just kept walking, kept moving. Um, probably not life or death, but it was a bad, bad situation. Yeah, it potentially could have been, like you said, life-threatening. Yeah. Now, the other time this has happened to me, I was hunting, and, man, I had much better gear. This was just a few years ago. This This fishing experience, you know, 20 years ago, they didn't have the technology and the good gear that we have today. I mean, today we have cell phones, right? We have yeah, better clothing, better technology. If I was wearing the clothes I wear today, they would have maybe dried out, but at the least they would have somewhat insulated too, right? Yeah, definitely. 20 years is just huge as far as technology goes. Just yeah, I remember those days. Yeah. It's a lot better to be in the back country now than it would have been then <laughs> yeah for sure you know and i don't go fishing in blue jeans anymore either <laughs> <laughs> so well. so one last point jason i want to make on on gear list um if you are backcountry fishermen if you're going deep you know more than a mile from the truck one last thing i would add to to the pack that you should probably consider throwing in is an extra rod or reel um, and maybe a few tools to fix uh, broken gear. Uh, you know, that would really bite if you, you're a mile or two miles from your truck. You break your rod or your reel and you don't have a spare, a backup. So one thing you and I do is we don't both pack an extra rod or reel. We just take one between us. Um, we, you know, a good tip is don't double up on all the same gear um, yes. If you're going with a buddy or two guys, you know, if you're going to spend the whole day and you want to cook a hot meal and you're taking a little stove, you know, a little gas canister, all three of you don't need to take one. Yeah. That's a really good point. Just kind of plan ahead and save room and you can bring a, a more diverse array of, of products if you both carry different things and you don't really need to carry the same thing. Two stoves, two water filters, two of this and that, right. when you could really plan ahead and 
have more useful things with the available space in your pack, right? Yeah, yeah. No need for both of us to pack a camera, you know. So, you know, just uh, that's that's a final parting tip I would suggest is to keep the pack weight light. Um, I would say too, Chad, watch for our beanie that's going to be coming out soon. <laughs> because... <laughs> I think that's the most essential thing. When I go out in the winter, I am looking for that beanie. Everything else in the packs just kind of, yeah, I I need it. But the beanie, oh my goodness, without that, it, it would be hard. That cold air on your ears all the time and the heat just escaping out of the top of your head. So the beanie is essential for me. i got to have one, two, maybe even three. Well, you, My you wife have- loves it too when I wear them. You usually do have three in your pack, but, <laughs> but that's okay because they're so collapsible. They weigh essentially nothing, so why not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Jason, any Beanies. any parting tips for these guys that are out fishing these cold weather months? Well, I... Every situation is different, you know, like uh, how far away you are from your vehicle or how long you plan to be out or the weather conditions that day. But my my tip would be to plan for what you don't expect. And that might be hard because you're thinking about the fishing and you're not thinking that something could happen. But plan for the eventuality of an event that you're not expecting. And that way you're, you're covered. I mean, that would be my tip. Perfect. I mean, even a seasoned guy like you, you get so focused on the fishing, you jump into my truck in your house slippers. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Because, you know, it just wasn't on my mind. I was just thinking about the fishing and, and of course, all that stuff's going to make it with you on your trip. It's the things that you may need that you're not thinking about that you got to plan ahead for. Well, unfortunately for you, if it was anything other than footwear, it was probably in your pack. But <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, guys. Well, we thanks, thank you for listening this week to our Cold Weather Fishing Podcast. Stay safe on your fishing adventures and stick them solid. Stick them solid.